Hit the drop. And what? I'm gonna disclose the location. Are you good? We in Atlanta, baby. No Atlanta, we. Not TV. The vibe is different. The vibe is different. Keep them, keep them, keep them. See what I did there? I happened to be playing vibe, and I said the vibe was different. Oh, okay, Mike. Woo! Alright, alright, alright. Fitty, fitty, fitty. It's time to get started, right? Yes, let's do yeah, it. You gotta cut the record. Hey! <laughs> here we are, here we are. My voice even sound different. You know, is that Atlanta air? It makes. You're blaming, makes, you're blaming the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah, not yeah. maybe <laughs> Casa Mingos? Casa, Casa who? No sabe, no sabe eso, no sabe. <laughs> que, que, so, que, que es Casa Amigo? I never heard of that. Le Timo League is me, okay? I've uh, never heard of Casa Amigo. But hey, listen, welcome, 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 welcome to another episode of the Haitian Millennial Podcast. Uh, I'm Mark the Dreamer, and to my left, mm. I am with a Haitian queen. She goes by the name of... Gigi, and I'm real. The realest. The realest, the realest, the realest. And this time, we're going to just throw some gunshots out there. Uh, we, we don't have our third member. Mm -hmm. So shout out to Leona. Leona was popping. Was popping. Atlanta's a vibe. Wish you were here. But we do have a special, special guest. Um, as we started the season, we told you guys that this season is all about Haitian success. Um, we are highlighting the successful people in our generation who have been able to do things that, you know, you may ask yourself, how did they do it, mm -hmm. right? How did they get to this point? So this season, we're going to focus on actually getting that story um, and putting it out there for you, not only to be inspired, but also to be aware that this Haitian millennial is just doing it. Yep. Just out there being a trailblazer, doing things. So without further ado he is none other than cousin jude what's, what's happening what's we're doing on, a round of applause everybody. round of applause we have cousin jude in the building hold on we have to do gunshots too not just round of applause we have to do gunshots too what's happening man we're in your city we're in your city you are in my city like how you feeling how you feeling feeling good i appreciate you guys for the invite nah, i appreciate y'all for coming out to atlanta first of all nah listen yes. it's always a vibe you know i had to i had to go to h&m and pick up a shirt that's how i felt <laughs> i felt like i needed to to buy something atlanta to feel like i'm here so <laughs> this was a pleasure for me um, absolutely for us in general even yes. leona's not here but for the whole crew to have you and be able to talk about your success and where you're at um before we even get there like how would you define your version of success, yeah. like Haitian success? Like if you were to kind of put it into... My version of success, I don't really know how to answer that. My version of success is basically me being happy with who I am and where mm -hmm. I am in life. I'm not really caring about what anybody else thinks. That's a bar. Period. Yeah. That's a bar. That, and, that's, and that's how we start our, our first <laughs> series of um, Haitian success. Uh, listen, I, I talk a lot. Obviously, um, I'm on a podcast. However, today I'm going to pass it off to the extraordinaire, the realist, uh, Gigi. She's going to be the one uh, doing most of the talking today. All right. <laughs> Cousin Jude, um, again, we're super excited that you're here. When we were talking about who we wanted to invite, you were on our list, and you were like, we have to start with you. We have to start with you. On Instagram, you are close to 50,000 followers. Sick of me. You are a chef. You are an influencer. You are a traveler. You are multi-talented and so diverse in so many different ways. <laughs> and, 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 and you have, you know, poverty and, you yes. know, and all of this. And so take us to the, from the very beginning. Like, tell us about your childhood, your upbringing, and then, and then we'll, and we'll go from there. Oh, this could be a long ass story. Naki Naki Uh First off, I was born and raised in Spring Valley, New York. Okay. Um, mm. By two Haitian parents. Mm. My mom's side of the family is from the South, 
They're okay. from um, Aken Fond de Blanc. Okay. My dad's side of the family is from Jacques Mel and Semak. What? So <gasps> I'm, I'm what you call a mixed Haitian. We might be related. We might be. You never know. My dad is from Jacques Mel too. You never know. Don't make you from Jacques Mel. My dad. It's not a said, big city. I <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. My dad. So I was raised by two Haitian Catholic liberal parents, which influenced a lot of, you know, who I am today. And, um, you know, basically was told by my parents growing up that I had to go to college and Mm. I had to be in the medical field Mm. to be successful. If not, I was a failure. And growing up, like, although that's what they told me I need to do in college, I played sports until high school. Um, once I got into high school, I left sports alone and I joined the arts. Like I got into plays, I was in musicals, I was in the or- well, I was in the orchestra since like the, the fourth grade. Mm-hmm. So I played the violin and okay. the bass violin okay. from like fourth grade until like senior year in high school. Okay. Um, most people don't know that about me though. <laughs> hey. um, so I've Big always drop. been in the arts. I've always been interested in that kind of stuff. But once I got to college, I was always told that, you know, you got to leave that alone. That's high school. Leave mm. it alone. And you got to do something else. So I started college off with um, going to school to become a nurse. Mm. Mm. And without my parents' knowledge, I dropped out of nursing school. With, uh, without Mati. your parents' knowledge. Mati. Yeah. Mati. With, 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 without my parents' <laughs> knowledge, I dropped out of nursing school. And then... Um, got into culinary mm. and I went to culinary school. Now, the thing is when I was in college, um, I was working in the emergency room in Tallahassee okay, and, and as a nurse tech. And that's when I realized that this could not be my life. Mm. Mm. And they didn't understand that they, you know, to yeah. them it's you got to live through them. Mm-hmm. They, they, you know, they got to live through you, you basically. Yeah, yeah. So they thought, you know, this is the, they don't know about all the other things in America. They just think nurse village, restaurant therapist village, and that's the only thing you can do. Mm-hmm. But I chose a different route. My parents told me that I was crazy <laughs> and that I, I will fail in life. Absolutely. <laughs> when I fail. Success. God is what? Good. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. So that's pretty much my upbringing. And then after that, you know, life started after college. Life started after college. Yeah. Okay, I have to go back to this. Being in nursing school, mm-hmm. deciding to drop out without telling your parents. Even that right there is like legendary, iconic. <laughs> Like, <laughs> what? <Knowing your-ish. laughs> so, like, you were you were working in the hospital. You mm-hmm. realized you don't want to do it. Did you talk to like? Did you call your mom first and try to like? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> Just he, t- he took matters into his own hands. My thing was when I was in college, my parents helped me out with like my rent, my mm-hmm. car payment, but they were not paying for college. Mm-hmm. I was taking loans out the ass. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, yeah okay. good. I was taking loans and and paying for things for myself, and I'm just like. Wh- wh- I'm taking all this debt in for something that I don't want to do. I'm not doing it no more. Mm. And you'll find out when you need to find out. Mm. That's crazy. What you going to do, beat me? Oh, <laughs> but Okay. Bin bat you, you know, you know Leona would have loved this. She's no, a, no. She, she's, she's the cape for bin bat. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's important because I realize, like, you know, when you hear other millennials talk about it, and I, I've dealt with this too, you become an adult and you still have your parents' voice in your head, like as if they are physically standing in front of you telling you what to do. So that's why I'm like extremely impressed by you. I still have my parents' voice in my head with certain things. There's certain things that I just will not do because of my parents' influence, like drugs and certain things. I'd be like, what? Crack? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's crack. No. Wait, what? Okay. Are people offering people crack? Yes. Yeah, Maybe yeah. not so much crack, okay. but <laughs> cocaine. cocaine. I don't cocaine. Run, those, are not, those are not the circles I'm running, but cocaine has been offered to me <laughs> yeah. several times in Atlanta. Okay, yeah, cocaine. It's just like normal. Like you, you want to hit this? Like what? Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what job God do? <laughs> I dead ass stopped talking to this girl when I was in college. We used to work together, mm-hmm. and I'll never forget this. She used to leave every single day. Mind you, we worked with kids. Yeah. She used to leave every day for break uh-huh. and go out for a smoke break. And one day I decided to go out with her for the smoke break, and mm-hmm. she tried to hand me a cigarette. And I said, You know, I don't smoke cigarettes. And she was like, 
it's not just a cigarette. Like mm. I lace it, I, I lace it with cocaine. Oh my god! I said what? Oh, oh so she god. is kind of smoking. Crack. And I said to her, <laughs> my mother told me about people like. <laughs> So my mother told me anybody who will offer me crack, <laughs> mind you, it was cocaine, but to a Haitian, it's crack. crack. I said, anybody who will offer me crack is not a friend of mine. My jambala si <laughs> Oh, good. Sir. How dare you try to get me to become a crackhead with you? No, I mean, there's a lot of things about this story that is just like, cocaine is an expensive drug. It is. It's an expensive drug. I can't afford weed. Why would I smoke coke? <laughs> so when you graduated from Cole, well, back up, because I'm like, okay, fun fact. I love watching like Top Chef, all the culinary shows. How would, like, what was your training background? Was it French? Like... So I actually specialized in baking and pastry. I'm a pastry mm. chef by trade. Okay. Mm. I did that because I was my aunt is a baker mm -hmm. and she made me fall in love with baking growing up my aunt was my next door neighbor as well so mm -hmm. i was always at her house watching her bake and helping her ever since i was a child and i also realized um when i got older that baking was an art and not many people can do it mm -hmm. but there are so many chefs out there like when i was in baking and pastry there were 13 of us in the program where the culinary program had over 200 students wow. so there are so just so many of us that do it which there's more money in baking. I can charge you anything for a wedding cake. Oh, that's cake. facts. You're going to have to pay it because where are you going to go? The next person's going to charge you just as much I know. or even more. And then you're stuck with Publix. Right. <laughs> Them spongy ass cakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Good shot. Good shot. It's so cakes over, I, wanted, over. I wanted to, and I also loved it because I love baking. Like you literally have me in a bakery all day long. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's my passion right there. Mm -hmm. Food, I love to cook. But that's not my passion. Okay. Mm, baking is. Jude, you and I, we, we're here. <laughs> I love baking, too. That's awesome. Does, does bread pudding count as baking? No. Dang. Because I love that. I, I mean, bread that. pudding, yeah. No, but that's like the dessert chefs make when they need to make a dessert. Real quick. And they, they don't know what else to do. It's real quick? Exactly. It's real quick. Yeah, it's yo, quick I and easy. Yo, I love bread pudding so much. And you, plus, you, the you, raisins. Just don't put no nuts in it. Pause. Like, don't do that. <laughs> don't put no nuts in it. Why would you put nuts in Yeah, why would you put nuts? No, people do that. That's uh, nasty. Walnuts. Like, I've, um, there's a place in, in Orlando right now that I go to get my bread pudding. It was good at first. Somebody decided to just mess it up. And, and I'm just like, hey, uh, is there a chef back there that changed it? Like, no, he, he sprinkled some walnut here and there. No, it's not here and there. Every bite has <laughs> walnut in there. Maybe, I've never seen I that. Digress. I digress. I digress. <laughs> so that means, okay, does that mean when you, do, when you specialize in baking and pastry, is it automatically French? No. Okay. I mean, we did. The, so the baking and pastry program, um, you went through so many different things. You went through American breads. You went through European breads. You went through European cakes. You went through, you, it's just, it's, baking is literally a science. Mm -hmm. And that's why many can't do it. Because if you don't follow the exact science, you will fail. Mm -hmm. So you had to learn the science of it. But as, as, also, in baking and pastry, you still had to learn the culinary aspect of it all, and you also had to learn how to run a restaurant. You had to learn how to manage it. You had to learn how to manage the books. You had to learn how to break down recipes. You had to learn like all these mathematical things, which I never thought that I would really need in cooking, because I suck at math. So it's like in math class, they always said you will need this. You will need this later on in life. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm gonna be baking. But yeah. Okay. Very cool. So now we're at. You've graduated. You are officially a chef. And what happened then? After that, my mom convinced me to move back to New York. Okay. And like a dumbass, I did. She was <laughs> like, which she did. Oh, wow. And she's like, why was I Kai? Which I didn't. My mother, <laughs> she, I, I'm, a, I'm the last one of two, mm. and I'm spoiled. Mm. So she just basically Ooh. let me know that she would spoil me even more just to come home. Because my brother had left the house like, right after college and never came back. So I was like, all right, I'll come back and reap all the benefits that he's not reaping. Right. So I went back, but I hated New York. And then finding a job was not quite easy either. So my mother worked at a nursing home and mm -hmm. she got me a job working in the kitchen. But I'm fresh out of culinary school with a degree and I'm working in this kitchen as a, what was I called? A dietary aide. Mm. So I literally was a dishwasher. Mm. I washed pots and I... I helped on the line where we like assembled trays mm -hmm. for everybody. Worked there for a little bit and then I worked my way up to a cook position. Okay. After working as a cook there um, for a little bit, I went applied somewhere else as a food. 
I watched my food service manager because he was a black guy. He was real cool too, and he was an ex an ex con. Okay. Mm. From back in the day, he used to rob banks when he was younger. Okay. Wow. Did his time, came back and became legit. Okay. So, dude taught me a lot about running a nursing home kitchen or running an, an industrial sized kitchen period. Mm-hmm. So I learned a lot from him, took that, lied on my resume, went somewhere else mm. and said that I was a food service director. Do you want to mm. say lie or did you enhance? Embellish. Embellish. <laughs> I embellished it a bit. Because had I said the truth, I would have never gotten the gig. There we go. So I got the first gig because I embellished on my resume. Yes. And I royally jacked up these people's stuff because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I had seen it done, but mm-hmm. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. But I learned through all my mistakes. So sorry for them because the mistakes was made with their money. But after leaving there, <laughs> I moved to Georgia and then I was good to go from there. And that's what I did for like the past like 10, 15, 10 to 12 years. I've been managing like healthcare kitchens all while running my wow. own company. Wow. Shh, round so of applause. You, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Round, round of applause for understanding leverage. Mm. Understanding what you okay. Go no, no, he, you're getting to the point I'm making because technically you still stayed in the healthcare industry, mm-hmm. but you got to follow what you wanted exactly. to do. Exactly, and that's another thing too because I remember maybe when I was in Georgia, maybe like a year to me being in Georgia, I remember hearing some nurses on the staff complaining about their pay, and when I heard what they were getting paid, I laughed in my head because I couldn't tell them what I was doing, <laughs> and I was just like, "Oh damn!" And I called my mom, and I was like, "Who's just sending I was like, "Yo, they out here booyking these ladies, and they ain't even paying them." No, that's facts. And I realized that I was more, um, what was the word? I was more of a need in there because there are a billion nurses mm-hmm. running around, but mm-hmm. there are not a billion food service directors running around. There's you not. gotta really know what you're doing. There's you not. gotta have certain certificates mm-hmm. and you gotta have a lot of experience to be able to run a kitchen of a 200 bed, 200 or more bed facility. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I was making a good pretty penny out here. I, was, I actually made more money in Georgia doing what I do than in New York. Wow. Because there were less qualified people in Georgia to do it. Yeah, it goes back to what we were saying before we started, you know, the mics were on, how like Haitian people just, they have tunnel vision. Tunnel vision. But look at that. You're right. Look at that. Would you <laughs> consider yourself to be fearless? I'm very fearless. Mm. Mm. At the end of the day, your fear is you stopping yourself for what? It's like, whatever you want to do, whatever I want to do, I'm going to do it. If I fail at it, then I'm going to try again. And the next time I try, I know what I did wrong the first time, mm-hmm. and I can correct myself for the next time. Mm. But if I don't ever try it, how am I going to know whether I'm going to succeed or not? <laughs> Steve Harvey went and got motivation like this. <laughs> hold on, hold on. To, 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 to pivot into the conversation, we're going to take a small break uh, and we'll be right back with none other than Cousin Jude. And, and where we at? Where we at? We're in Atlanta. <laughs> Atlanta, baby. Let's get it. <laughs> Alright, let me stop, let me stop, let's stop. Back to back to uh, the awesome conversation. Gigi, take it away. Okay. So now let's start with why cousin Jude? Like why why that? So for you so in college, I used, I started going by a name that everybody gave me in college, which was um Chef Zul. Mm. Okay. So in college, that's what I was known as. And after college, I was known as Chef Zul for a little bit. But then it was just like, okay, I'm moving into a more professional lane. That needs to change. So then I became known as Chef Jude Pierre. Mm-hmm. And then after a while, I don't living in Georgia, just everybody got very comfortable with me here. All my clients and stuff just got very comfortable. And I'll never forget one day. So I always sell plates out of the crib. That's just like my side hustle. On okay. the weekends, I sell plates out the crib. And this particular day, I was... Um, some place at my crib and I lived in Lithonia. And <laughs> the way my house was set up, I lived in a ranch. I lived in a large ranch and I had a carport. But on the side of my carport, there was a door that leads into my there was a door that leads into my dining room. There's a door that leads directly into my kitchen. Mm-hmm. Now, all my clients know when you show up to my house, you stay in your car and I bring the food to you. They got so damn comfortable with me, I'll never forget one day my it was 
January 1st, my back was turned, I'm in the kitchen, I hear the screen door open behind me, then I just hear my door open, boom, and I just hear, Cousin Jude, Kotsub Jumumna, and I was like, nah, that's it, that's the name, I'm running with that, and that's how I became Cousin Jude. Wow. Okay, and then, like, your followers are referred to as your... They're all my cousins. They're all your cousins, very cool. My real blood cousins hate it. <laughs> really? Yeah. They hate Why? it. Why? So my, I have a very large family. Okay. My grandfather had 32 kids on mm. my mom's side. Mm. So all 30. those cousins, like, there's a lot of them oh, on no. that side. We, That's might, we might be related. Then my dad's <laughs> side of the family is very large as well. So I have a lot of cousins. Like I have, And I'm one of the cousins that's close with almost all of my cousins. Mm-hmm. So like whenever there's a conversation around like, yeah, you ever heard of Cousin Jude? Or, and they be like, oh, yeah, that's my cousin. They're like, yeah, that's everybody's cousin. And they be like, no, that's my cousin. They be like, no, 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 no that's everybody's cousin. And it be, they'll have to call me and be like, can you tell us, nigga, that I'm your real cousin? <laughs> But yeah, they hate it. <laughs> oh my goodness! That, that's that's I never thought about that issue. Yeah. Right? Real cousins having beef with <laughs> like none real cousins. Yeah, that's oh my crazy. goodness! And yo, and then once you once you identify as a cousin, right? Why, why would you take that title away? Exactly. As you pro- even try to claim cousin. <laughs> No, but for real though, like it might, it might, it might, it might. Don't want to visit cousin. So, um, tell us about your business. We see that you travel, you do catering events. You said you, you know. So, my business is pretty much all over the place these days. <laughs> kind of like me. I'm a Gemini. I literally do Gemini. whatever I feel like doing whenever I feel like doing it. Is your birthday this month or June? This month, May 30th. Mm. So, I started off as a caterer. And somehow I morphed into a social media influencer. Mm. I, people find me entertaining. I crack jokes. I ran with that. Um, I also travel a lot. I'm a Ipav. I started the Pure Poverty Movement. I ran with that. So it's like, I'm a chef. I'm a caterer. I'm an Ipav. I'm an influencer. I, I, I don't really know. The business is everywhere right now. Oh, my goodness. So, like, where do you feel like you, like, you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm having the most fun. I'm enjoying this. Like, what part of your business? When I'm traveling. So about a year ago, I started traveling state to state to do different pop-ups. Mm. And it's just amazing to, like, go to places that I've never been before and for hundreds of people to flock out to come buy food for me and tell me their testimonials. Like, at first, that was weird as hell. <laughs> like, for people to, like, stand there and be like, oh, my God, I love you so much. You don't understand. Like, your videos like brighten up my day and I'm like me like I just be talking shit y'all like that (laughs) but that's like the best part for me is like meeting the people who've been supporting me for all this time like I just came back from Houston on Monday and a dude that I met over there who had a Haitian food truck in Houston Mm -hmm. this man got out the car to come tell me how much he appreciates me and how much he appreciates the movement Mm -hmm. and how I'm putting you know the culture out there and all this other stuff it's just that's like the best part for me oh wow the, uh, sorry, I have a, a question. No, go ahead, go up. ahead. Not a, not a question, but more like a thing. As you were talking, right, and you, you talked about your house in Lithonia and, <laughs> and how you had people coming out and um, you got the name. Um, so then that name transferred to social media that puts you in the influencer aspect. So now not only did you start with these that were like your cousin, now you built a, a network of cousins, right? And now you're traveling to have that contact it's almost like, again, that family thing. Mm-hmm. You're meeting people, and you're doing that, and that's the most fun part of what you do, which technically is the essence of what started everything. So do you ever have a full circle moment where you like, I started here, and this is now where I'm at, and it's all like the same. It's almost like the same bubble, but just bigger. It's almost like you never lost a little bit of anything. It just got bigger. So how do you feel? Do you ever get that moment? Every time, so I drive to everywhere, everywhere mm. I go. So, and everybody always thinks I'm crazy because they're like, why are you I, 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 I judged you a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing long distance drives since I was 18. I drove myself to college in Florida by myself. Mm. So, I mean, I drive. And for me, driving always clears my mind and helps me to, like, bring a lot of things in, into perspective. Right so whenever I'm driving back from a pop-up, like, I just get to think about all these things and mm-hmm. I get to appreciate where I am versus where I was. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I do. Ha- I have a full circle moment every single time I'm leaving, like, a new, another city. Oh, wow. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so Haitian food, right? It is 
amazing. We love it. But hasn't really had, in my opinion, the same popularity as, let's say, Jamaican food or Trinidadian food. Why do you think that is? Because a lot of people hate Haitians. Mm. Mm. Um, so Twitter, I like one much. A Haitian lot of people just like right us. Yeah. We're literally the most hated country in the Caribbean. Um, when you go under other people, like let's say you go on a Caribbean um, page on Instagram, mm-hmm. and somebody posts something about Haiti, where there's a whole bunch of other Caribbean people under it. There's going to be a bunch of other countries bashing Haiti for whatever reason. So because of that, our food, just like our culture, always gets bashed. Now, does that really bother me? No. I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing to move the culture forward. Mm -hmm. If if other people decide to indulge in our food, then I'm happy because then I got one more person to try it. Mm -hmm. But if not, problem po, (laughs) because we still going to enjoy it. Did you ever feel um, like pressure to switch your culinary list? Um, like what type of I've food I've never you made? felt it, but I have been told by a few Haitian chefs that, you know, to make it, you got to switch things up a little bit. Mm. And, you got, and I'm just like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I'm like, if you want to appease these blunts, then you can do that. But this is my style. This is what I do. I'm in, no, I've never felt pressure. Okay. Okay. R- okay. Round of applause for stand, standing your ground. No, that's, just- that's important because... For me, I just noticed that Haitian food just really has not been able to take off. But to your point, yeah, there's a lot of hate. But it is taking off a little bit now because of social media. Like, I'm also very um, active on TikTok. Mm. I have, like, 37,000 followers on Mm. TikTok. And TikTok pushes things way further than Instagram does. The algorithm just, like, is different. Mm -hmm. So because of that, a lot of people are now trying it because they're seeing a lot of it on there. It's a trend. You Mm -hmm. know, people love trends. So Haitian food really is trending right now. Okay. Favorite Haitian dish? Lumbi and Haitian cake. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we had a conversation off mic about that. We issue. did. We I just wanted this to be on the record. And not, not every kind of lumbi. I like lumbi en sauce. Mm. Like I'll deal with lumbi boucané, but that ain't my that ain't my jazz. So so there was a thing about lumbi boucané. I was a big lumbi guy, right? Mm-hmm. So one time when I was still living in Haiti, we took a a mini, I guess, getaway. We went to um, somewhere near Mall Saint Nicolas. Right, so we stayed at somebody's house, right? And he, you know, he was doing well for himself. So as to, you know, as Haitian like to be very welcoming. First day, he was like, "Oh, nula, lumbi, lumbi bougonne." Right? We had lumbi, we ate fish, all of that, and it was good. Second day, lumbi bougonne, uncle. <laughs> I was like, "Okay, lumbi, two days. They must have a lot of lumbi." Third day, lumbi bougonne. <laughs> Fourth day, l- oh. <laughs> said, is that all you know how to make? Yo, the whole time, and it wasn't even him. You know, they got they got people cooking yeah. at the crib. So every day, one one day I was like, yo, you got some, you got some like, you know, chicken. <laughs> that at that point, ever since then, I don't know, I could never really get back into Lumbi like that. I, I you know, and uh, source is called it, be done. Right, right, right. I got that, and it just, I never got into it. But anyway, that was just a small thing yeah. about Haitians who they just they when they get some good, they just overdo it. Right, okay. overdo it. What's your least favorite dish? My mule. Mm. Hate it. What? Why do you hate my mule? You yeah. eat piti me though? I, as an adult now, I like piti me. You like piti me over my mule? Yeah. Oh, that's a fight. Oh, it's no. something about the that's texture of it because I don't like grits either. Oh. Okay, okay. I do hey. not like that gritty yo, yo, texture. Yo, yo, yo. Be careful. You, you're talking too loud. You're in Atlanta, yo. Grits. Fuck that grits. I don't <laughs> like that shit. <laughs> Yo, you, you can't speak that loud about grits in Atlanta, bro. Nah, kid, I don't like grits. I don't like mine willing. But PC me, I'll deal with it now. Wow. Like, as a kid, I hated PC me. I hated mm. Kalalu. Mm. I hated Zaboka. I love all three now. I, and I hated Blay. I love Blay now. Wow. I, I, I can relate to you on the Zaboka. But Blay was like the first thing I learned to cook. I learned to cook Blay. Because I, I used to go, um, during the summer, I used to go under to visit my grandma. Mm-hmm. They gave me a little pot. They taught me how to cook blé. That was the first thing I learned how to cook. So I would eat blé with nothing. That's the only food I could eat without meat. Yeah, I'm a Mai fan. That mm. shit is nasty. I think it's so good. It just, to me, it just looks like manje pou bai kosho manje Like, I just cannot. <laughs> nothing about it looks good to me. Just pou bai lango pla. No, you no, 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 and then you got to eat it straight off the fire. You do. 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 You
<laughs> but like with some poisson, a zabuka. <laughs> yeah, which one, which one do you eat? The, the yellow one or the, the yellow the, one? The, 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 the sauce one. No, no, yellow. Yeah. yellow. I like the sauce one. The yellow <laughs> one. Last time I ate my moon, I was in Haiti. It was mm. like. Christmas vacation of 2012. Mm, he remember exactly. I remember because I was traumatized. <laughs> so I woke up that day and decided I was going to go to a Haitian, well, a Haitian restaurant, of course, because I was in Haiti. And <laughs> we went to go eat, and it was like a buffet style. So plein vent moi manger. Got mm. back to my aunt's crib in Port Prince, and she's like, manger en sous We and I was like, I'm fixing up no restaurant. She's like, I'm about to go to no restaurant, manger en sous table. And I get down there, it's my moulin. I'm like, nah, son. She was like, what manger le moment? <laughs> Mind you, I'm grown, but I'm scared of this lady, so I gotta eat this mayunle. I ate the mayunle on so spot. I ate half of it because, of course, they put too much food on my plate. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm big, but I ain't that big. <laughs> so I ate half of it and I went upstairs and I slept for 14 hours. Your manji en femme dormi. I never touched mayunle again. You had a coma. Yeah. Hey, that go to that trauma, that food trauma. That That's that food trauma. I ain't never touched it again. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh but, my you know, goodness. you have putting some context about you and Haiti and having Haitian food, but, you know, it's changing now. You could be a Haiti, and like I was in Haiti not too long ago, in September actually, in Port-au-Prince to be exact. I went to a, a restaurant and it was an Asian restaurant. I was like, "Ki did this at? Haiku? I, I don't remember the exact name. Pizza Mobility. Mm-hmm. It probably was Haiku. Mm-hmm. But I went there and I was like, oh, can I get some diab sauce bar with chicken? No, we have sushi. <laughs> we have, uh, you know, all that. I'm like, you why can would find you bring me here? You why would you bring me here? I'm so, I'm so, USC. I'm in Haiti. It would make no Asian restaurant. I was really mad at my godmother. There for was that, a yo. there was a point in time where there was a Irish pub mm. in Pensionville. And upstairs from the Irish pub there was a Jamaican restaurant. <laughs> the Jamaican restaurant, okay, but the Irish pub, how does that happen? <laughs> listen. I don't know. Listen, listen. Wow. Anyway, um speaking of Haiti, um you you did a you did a thing. Um, what thing? You did a thing. You see you, you know, right now uh, we talked we talked about it, the tour you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's called uh, Deportation tour? Yeah. Is yeah. that what it is? That's because what it is. of a thing that you did. So I don't want to give the people that thing. I want to kind of. He I, packed, he I, I sold all my shit. <laughs> I packed my bags and I left. So I'm here in Atlanta right now, but I don't really live here anymore. I live in Haiti. Mm. All mm. my stuff resides in my house in Haiti. Mm. The only thing I still have in America is one of my cars. I sold one car before I left. And Jude, I kept one car. You moved to Haiti. Yeah. Like recently, all the millennials yeah. listening right now. Do you hear this? A, a Haitian January millennial. thirtieth. I packed up my bags and I left. Okay, unpack it. I need to understand. I've been talking about moving to Haiti since I was in college. Okay, like even my American friends, like when I finally did it, they were like, "Oh my God, you've been talking about this since we were in school. You finally did this shit." And I'm <laughs> like, "Yeah, I finally did it." So in 2014, my mother retired and moved back to Haiti. She had built the house. And the house is always there. I started going to Haiti in 2011. Now, I went to Haiti the first time when I was two. I didn't go back to Haiti until I was 25 after mm. that. So all throughout that time, I was living vicariously through everyone else who was going to Haiti mm-hmm. or watching it online. Mm-hmm. But then finally, I got to go in 2011. And that's another story in itself. So, I'll tell you that real quick. <laughs> so my mom and my father used to go to Haiti every single year, but never would take me. The Earliest excuses was all zingle do pral pon. Then it was yo pral manjo. When my mother's from under yo, so there's a, like a lot of jobs out there. So she was always like, oh my business me no under yo ya manjo, but I'm I'm just like, okay, whatever. So then years go on, and my parents never renewed my passport when it expired as a kid because they just didn't want me going to Haiti. Mm-hmm. So I was so used to not having a passport, I never paid it no mind. And then finally one year, my cousin. Invited me to go to Jamaica with her, and I was just like, I, it was 2011. I was like, I can't go. She was like, wow. I was like, I have no passport. She was like, my nigga, go get your passport mm-hmm. done. I was like, oh, I'm an adult now. I can do that. <laughs> so I went and got my passport done. And then a month later, my mom was like, I need you to book a ticket for me to go to Haiti in August. And I was like, okay, no problem. And she gives me her car, her credit card. And mm-hmm. I was like, all right, we're going to book two of these bitches. <laughs> And I didn't tell her nothing. And then one of my cousins caught on the game. She was like, Ça est premier fois pas Haiti, j'ai pas un mail de non? J'ai le gars là, j'ai un ticket, voilà Haiti. And I'm like, mm-mm. And then a month before we were supposed to go to Haiti, my uncle, my mother's brother, passed away. Uh. So then I was like, well, 
I'm going to Haiti with you, mom. And she was like, no, you're not. I was like, well, I got a passport. She can't stop me. So I bought a ticket for her and I, again, on her <laughs> card. And I went to Haiti with her for six days. And then I got there and I was like, oh, this is life. I mean, it was like maybe a couple of... So the earthquake happened in January. This was in the summer. So it was the summer after the earthquake. Wow. Haiti was still very much in shambles. Mm -hmm. But I was just happy to be there. Mm -hmm. And then since then, I've been in Haiti like 30 times. And my mother built the house. The house was sitting there. And I've been complaining all these years about wanting to move to Haiti, wanting to move to Haiti. And I finally got to the point where I was like, I'm not going to complain anymore. And I tried to move several times. Every time I was supposed to move, something crazy happened in Haiti. Like, literally, every time, like, the week of, something crazy happened. My mom was like, cancel the care ou pas And then finally... It came to the point where it was time for me to renew my lease here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And they was about to up my rent. $500. $500. Oh, my goodness. I said, oh, no. Malaiti. Kai Kiamba. Rent free. Some mortgage. I think we only pay, like, water every, like, six months or something like that. I don't even know what it is, but it's, like, chump change. We don't pay for electricity because we have solar panels and inverters. I'm like, why am I here struggling with you Americans? I'm out this piece. <laughs> so I chucked the deuces I sold everything And I left <laughs> Dude That is amazing Man This man is my idol right now As I'm Literally as I was moving to Haiti My mother was moving Back from Haiti My mom just bought a condo And lives in New York now mm. So the house He moved back to New York You want to get him in New York Leave him She can have a kid I don't want that <laughs> That's crazy. So then, what's life like for you? Like, being now a Haitian resident, like, you literally are a resident of Haiti. Is it okay to tell people where you moved to, like, in Haiti? I live in the like, South. I ain't telling them no more than okay, that. Got it, got okay, it, got we it. got you. We got you. Good to know. Yes. Because we don't want people to think you moved to Port with. Because they're going to do, do? The, hey! <laughs> the crazy thing is, everybody online thinks that I moved to Okap. I don't, they, in their minds, they think Okap is the only safe place and Okap is the only pretty place in mm. Haiti. So whenever they see the scenery and where I'm at, they're like, oh my God, Okap is so beautiful. I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the north. Right. Uh, for people who don't know, uh, for some context, oh that's goodness. the north of Haiti. Do you ever, is, does it ever like bother you, like just the lack of like awareness or lack of information people have about the, our island, like just geographically? Um, it doesn't bother me when non-Haitians don't know because mm -hmm. you just don't know what you, what you don't know you don't know yeah. like we don't know everything about other countries so I can't expect you to know everything about mine mm -hmm. but it really bothers me when Haitians and Haitian Americans don't know there are a lot of people who are born and raised in Haiti who don't know the ge anything about geography about Haiti mm -hmm. they be like Kikote I'm just like, where did you go to school? <laughs> yeah, but I, I have one of my homeboys who was raised in Haiti and said he was like in his teens and he doesn't know much about Haiti. I'm like, what bubble were you living in? <laughs> and it makes no sense to me. I'm like, I was born and raised in America and I know more about Haiti than you do. Mm -hmm. That I don't like. Before mm -hmm. a random person who don't know anything about Haiti, I don't care. Mm. Okay, um, random question. Um, how did you learn Creole? My mother only spoke Creole in the house. Mm. She never spoke English. My father only spoke English in the house. Mm. He never spoke Creole. Mm. So it was like we learned, but, and yeah. Okay. And we only spoke English back to my mother. Mm. So my mother's fluent in English. She made us fluent in Creole. Mm. And my father just, and, but the crazy thing is my dad never realized how good I was in Creole mm. since he never spoke it to me. So I, I learned a lot about who he really was because he didn't know I could understand what he was saying. Cat, okay. yeah, cat, cat, cat. Mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> That's interesting. A lot of us, I think, millennials, we picked up, you know, especially Haitian millennials in America, you pick it up from home. Mm -hmm. Like, there's not like a rule book to say, "Hey, learn, learn Creole here." Yeah. Uh, it's more like we pick it up from home. That mm -hmm. that also goes to our just just how how good we adapt as mm -hmm. people. Um, that we could just pick it up, even if you weren't born in the country, you could just pick it up. Yeah. Similar to Spanish, um, same thing with mm -hmm. Hispanics as well. So I think we're we're great in that era. I mean, area to to do that. And then also, I was raised in an area that had a lot of Haitians, so mm -hmm. I went to school with a lot of Haitians, mm -hmm. and a lot of us spoke Creole to each other. And so mm -hmm. when we we didn't want the blunts to understand what we were saying, <laughs> <laughs> it's the best thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so before we leave Haiti, right? Uh, before we leave that subject um, per se. When you are there, do you feel like you belong? Like, how do you feel? Like, do you feel like, since you moved? Do you feel like it's home yet? Or how is that process going? It took a while for it to feel like it was home. Um, not a while. I want to say, like, maybe three weeks. It took, like, three weeks for me to feel like it was mm -hmm. home. 
because for the first couple of weeks, like my, my god brother who lives in the house with me, um, he was babying me. Like he wouldn't let me go nowhere on my own. He was always, you know, always had to be with me and stuff. And then finally I was like, bro, <laughs> 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 like every time I wanted to go to the beach, he was like, hey, man, I'm like, no, you can't go everywhere with me. Go to work. Like, so finally when he's like left me alone and let me do my own thing mm -hmm. and I started voyaging and going to Jacques Mel alone and going to do this and going to do that I was like all right now this feels at home and I got my whole routine down packed with all right Mashi boy is on this day there's a Mashi over here on that day in between that time I got to go to the grocery store to go get this on this day that's when I felt at home mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. This, this, this is like one of those things I'm living through you right now, especially we see your stuff um, on social media and uh, um, seeing the, the car stuff that you were having. And, and you go into the gym. I was like, yo, dude is actually, he's in there. Bro, look, he's in there. <laughs> I kept saying I need to find a gym. And my mom was like, if I get gym, no on the... And then that gym that I found was right next to the Mashi. And I was walking from the Mashi on a Sunday. And I was like, they look like they working out in there. But it's like concrete fucking steel <laughs> in the middle of a yard everything is handmade so the dude who owns the makeshift gym he's a steel worker mm -hmm. so he made all that stuff by hand mm -hmm. and i was like it's either this or i don't work out and i enjoy working out so i gotta do this mm -hmm. and i think i paid like the equivalent to like two dollars per month mm -hmm. so, or is it week it's like chump change yeah. yeah. They got a membership too. Yeah. yeah. They okay. got a membership. She pulls out her log. She's like, okay, Jude, Dumbreville. <laughs> and she's like, Dumbreville. For me, witness on New I'm like, yeah, I know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing about where I live. My family's from the area. So I don't necessarily know many people there, but they all know me. Whenever I'm walking down a the block, they're like, yes, I PC the <laughs> <laughs> You got a black card? If I go down there, can I join you? Like, okay, yeah. You have to <laughs> okay. And my mom made sure to call everybody to let them know that I was coming. Because so, you know, all the nonsense that's going on in Port-au-Prince, yes. a lot of people are trying to, a lot of the gang members are trying to leave and seek refuge out in the countryside. The gang members. The gang yeah. members. So, in the countryside, in the South, we don't play that shit. <laughs> so, if they suspect that you're a gang member, they gonna hem you up real quick and find out what you're doing there. So, she mm -hmm. was like, You're <laughs> 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 That is crazy. Fair warning. Right. Right. So, okay. So, you you just triggering so many things. If there was a movement, right, where Haitian Americans move to Haiti, what do you think would happen? Um, I honestly don't know. Okay. I don't know, and I don't I don't know if most Haitian Americans are ready for that move. It's not an easy transition. Mm -hmm. Me, who I, I did it, I'm doing it. It's not easy. There are days I wake up and I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? Like. <laughs> I, I would be a liar if I sat here and I just tell you that every day is just smooth sailing. And no, the shit is hard. Haitians are different. And you have to go to Haiti with a different mindset. Customer service is non existent. Um, things are ran the, the way they run it. And you either deal with it or you don't. And uh, it's just different. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how Haitian Americans would be able to just get up and make a movement to go over there. I don't know if they'd be able mm. to do it. So, I mean, I've never been to Haiti at all. You need to go. I know. I know. I tried. And you from, your family's from Jacques, man. You need to go. Okay, so here's the thing. I don't have a relationship with my dad. Uh -huh. So if I popped up, it, I mean, I'd be okay. But it'd be like an interesting pop-up to do. Is he in Haiti? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. He built a ranch. So. You need to just pop up on this. I ass. think I, yeah. Do you have any other siblings by him? Yes. Uh, they're in Haiti? I don't know. They could be everywhere. <laughs> My mind is always working on land. You gotta find, <laughs> you gotta find out where your tears at. <laughs> my my tears in me by there. My tears in me by there. My one is oldest kid, so I feel like I have more clean. Okay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we could keep you here all day, Jude. I, I think I think this conversation not like a hostage though. Right. Oh, my father the kidnapping. Okay. Okay. Is England do it? Oh, is England do? No, got it. Wait. I said they were going to keep you here. Uh, it's in her blood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, 
<laughs> but anyway, yeah, we, we could do this all day. But of course, uh, we know our listeners, they, they are, they're kind of spoiled. They can do this all day as well. But we have to keep some structure into this. Um, but just to get a little bit of, I guess, a resume, right? Um, from where you started to now, right? The the amount of success you've obtained, because this is again Haitian Millionaire success. And um, how do you feel when it comes to? I want to say like, what is? How do you feel right now, being in in this space of success in your life um, after you know making these decisions, re- leaving? nursing school and going to culinary school and making these choices and taking life by the horn right and say i'm gonna do this which is very millennial like by the way um how do you feel in this space currently about all the decisions you make over you made overall um i'd be a liar if i said that i don't regret some decisions that i made Mm -hmm. but overall where i am now in life i'm satisfied um there's still room for me to grow. Mm-hmm. I definitely will keep on growing, but I'm cool where I'm at. I what, love it. What, what, what are you doing when you see yourself 10 years from now? Where's Cousin G? What's he doing? 10 years from now, I will no longer be cooking for people. Mm. <laughs> no, I will no longer be cooking for people. I will literally just be traveling the world, experiencing different cultures, uh, exposing people to my culture. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Anthony Bourdain. Absolutely. Yes. I want to be the Haitian version of Anthony Bourdain <sighs> minus the drugs. Minus the, and yeah, all that other stuff. And the addiction yeah, yeah. and all that. But like, he was a genius. Yeah. And I literally model my life beside his. Like, that's that's who I want to be. You are on that journey, man. I yeah. see it. Have, I you, see read, it. have you read his book? I haven't read you his book. You should read his book. I will. You should. I'll order that as soon as I get home. Yeah. That, that is, yo, I see it. I see it. And I felt like I just got chills a little bit. My apologies. <laughs> I had to say that because that's one of the moments that I look and I'm like, you know, when you have that moment, like, yo, I see it. Like, it's right there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the version of yourself in that space would be great. And, you know, and I'm just putting it out there. If you ever need somebody to tell that story. You need somebody to grab that camera and do. Bro, stop playing. That <laughs> I'm just saying, I would be. It would be an honor for me to capture those. Okay. And listen, listen. Yeah, but let, no, no, no. Right over there. It's on record. Even, <laughs> even, even if right now, I know last time you were in Orlando, I didn't. We didn't, we didn't get the catch. But if you have a pop up that you got coming up, and you're like, yo, I feel like this might be the one that's a vibe and capture the, at you know the essence of what you do. Mm-hmm. Yo, I love that. Bro, listen. you're never available. Listen, listen, listen. Guess what? Guess what? Yo, Guess if what? I hit him up. Guess mm-hmm. what? I got a response like two days later. Guess what? Guess Yo, what? Guess what? Horrible Guess what? texter. Guess what? Guess what though? Guess what though? <laughs> I respond. <laughs> One. And two, I will make myself available. I'm, I'm, t- I'm telling Dark you. Because like, I, I make time for what I really am passionate about. And telling stories is what I'm passionate about. Okay. I do that. All day. And, and I'm, I'm a witness. Day. So I'll be like, hey. Everyone is a witness. Yeah, everyone's a witness. Because <laughs> I'll tag your ass. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> my cousin's booking my free. I'll be like, nous sommes jamais ces ça. Light him up. Nah, let's get it. Let's my cousins are goons. I've had my cousins go after people several times online. Okay. I love that. So one more question. Yeah, yeah, one more. What advice or what message do you want to give to the Haitian millennials that are listening right now? Be yourself. Be yourself in everything that you do. Um, stay true to yourself and be consistent in everything that you're doing because consistency is key. A lot of us in our generation have an issue with being consistent and have an issue with putting in a lot of work to get what we want. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we sometimes we want instant gratification mm. yeah. and that's what fucks us up. Mm. Mm. I've been doing this stuff for a very long time, since like 2008. Mm. I've been doing it, and it's 2023, and I'm still moving towards where I want to be. I'm still not even there yet. So just stay consistent, stay true to yourself. Um, Don't let anybody steer you in a different direction that you don't want to go in, and you'll get where you're going when you're supposed to get there. Absolutely. Jude, this has been such Mm. a blessing for me. Like, I was already impressed like when i was doing my research on the questions i was like oh he's so cool but honestly like when mark started the pot he talked about why we were highlighting haitian success and i want you to know that you literally are the personification of it stop you are you are 
And so thank you so much because thank you. this was like food for my soul. I, I, I hope the listeners also felt just how we felt when we were um, talking to you and listening to your stories because it is, it, it's just awesome to feel like us as a millennial generation, we are out there doing things and things that matter, things that we want to do, and we're doing it in our own way. Mm-hmm. And at some point, again, we love our parents. At some point, our parents will, or are looking and saying, I see it now. What you were talking about when, when you were making this decision and you stuck through everything, I see it. My mother said that to me not too long ago. Mm. And I was like, you mm. finally see it now? Right, She's right. like, I'm <laughs> And is, is, that, is that the best way of saying I'm proud of you? Yes. Because they won't <laughs> say it. They won't <laughs> With that said, man, it is a wrap. Thank you guys for listening to episode 34 with none other than our first guest of this series of Haitian success. Cousin Jude, it was a pleasure. Thank you. We should do this again. But listen, without, I, I think we should come back in Atlanta just to taste his food. What? I feel like we should Absolutely. do that. <laughs> I'm with it. I'm listen, down. Thank you guys for listening. And uh, we appreciate any first-time listeners or people who was there from day one. Um, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye, you guys. Let's get it. Ciao. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Quel faible. How do, how do people follow you? Like, I know we're going to put that on the thing, but, you know, this is a thing that they do on, on radios and interviews, right? We got to do that. Like, how do people find Cousin yeah. Jude? So you can find platforms? Cousin Jude on Instagram. You can find Cousin Jude on TikTok. You could also find Cousin Jude on YouTube. Cousin Jude on all platforms. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on any of the other stuff. I'm still old. I ain't got time for all that. <laughs> That's where you can find me. Thank you, Cousin Jude. You're welcome. <laughs> With that said... We got to do the outro proper, right? I'm Mark the Dreamer. I'm Gigi the Realist. And we had Cousin Jude on episode 34. Thank you, guys. Le pied bégat la cap volée